Good morning. It's uh, great to commence this series. Uh, over the past uh, week and a half, I've been travelling twice to Sydney and once to Melbourne uh, in my role of uh, heading the CRC, our denominational family. And uh, we had a fantastic time in Sydney. In Pastor Ian Miller's church, was the state conference. And then I went back uh, last Wednesday for the heads of the Pentecostal movements of Australia meet once a year. So I represent the CRC and we sat down and talked for a day and then I flew into Melbourne for a couple of days for our, our conference, our CRC conference there. Um, and look, the, the thing I just want to say is God is doing some amazing things across the country. And uh, there are lots of people coming to faith. There are lots of signs, wonders and miracles taking place new churches being planted, and uh, spiritual life right across the, uh, our own CRC movement and across the Pentecostal scene. So I was greatly encouraged that we're not alone. We have about probably uh, half a million uh, people who would belong to the Pentecostal movement uh, across Australia, and we probably represent, we would estimate, uh, maybe just on 2,000 churches and the largest movements, the Australian Christian churches, which was the Assemblies of God with about a thousand churches, and then the rest of the movements, another uh, six or seven probably make up another around a thousand, a whole pile of smaller independent ones. So uh, we're a force to be reckoned with. And in fact, the uh, church consultant that came and spoke to us said that we are the largest attendees across any uh, Christian movement uh, alongside the Catholics. So Catholic people are uh, probably number one in attending Mass every week, but then it would be the Pentecostals attending church. Then after that, it's, so, um, so the, uh, it's noticed by the community and by the society, and so we are, uh, and God is doing some wonderful things. And uh, we, that's why we want to plant, keep planting churches. Keep planting churches. That's why we're doing CFC South with Pastor Tim and Nick. And um, our prayer is, that it's going to be a big church, a significant church, an influential church, a fruitful church. In fact, I would love it to be uh, as large as what we have here. Not, not larger, but as large. <laughs> would that be all right? Would that be all right? No, may it be twice as large as what we have here. And we want the kingdom to expand, and may that CFC South plant a stack of churches right throughout the Fluoro Peninsula. Wouldn't that be great? So, uh, terrific. Hey, there's more. There is more. There's so much more. I've been a Christian 47 years and uh, I've known Jesus for that long and have uh, been the privilege of, of talking about him and the Father and the Holy Spirit. And I tell you, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. Uh, I'm just scratching the surface. I need another hundred lifetimes to explore who Jesus is and what he has done. In fact, my personal study for the first few months of this year is the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. I just want to go back, I'm just going back to Jesus' words, his words, his parables, his miracles. And, to, and my prayer is, Lord, help me to be aligned. Help me to be aligned. And when um, we heard the message the other week, who preached it? Was it Adrian about denying self, taking up your cross and following me? That slew me. I thought, oh. And some of the things that Jesus says are really hard. And, and Pastor Tim also shared a, a message on, on the, the, uh, the justice and the, the heart of God. Some of the things that Jesus says are really tough. But as, as followers, we have no choice. We're under orders. We are. We're under orders. And we are to make up our minds to obey him if we're Christ followers, even before he speaks to us through his word. And that's tough when he challenges your selfishness and your self-centeredness and to become more selfless and more Christ-centered and more generous and more giving and more loving. Uh, so he's very challenging. And, um, but I want to say a couple of things about uh, healing for today. And we're going to take communion together and then pray for a whole stack of you. So pray that I only speak for 20 minutes. Because we've got, to, we've got to feel that we want to pray for so many of you to receive what God has for you. Not to talk, not to interview, but to pray. The healing clinic, we can spend two hours talking, praying and having ten different kinds of prayers and lay hands on you and pray in the spirit over you, whatever. 
but this morning I want to lay a foundation. Healing is for today. Salvation is for today. Deliverance is for today. Freedom is for today. Um, and, and the reason why is because Jesus never changes. He never changes. The scripture says, Jesus Christ is the same. Do you want to say it with me? Yesterday and today and forever. So we don't just focus on the Jesus of history, the Jesus who walked this earth, the Jesus of yesterday. It's easy to become religious and devotees of a historical figure. It's also easy for us that, well, one day he will return and I'm focusing on the Jesus of forever and when he comes back to earth and wraps things up and, and there's a new creation and evil and sin and suffering and death and pain and all those ugly things are going to be removed by his presence and power. But it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever, but he is the, the same today. Today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of healing. Today is the day of deliverance that you can overcome the devil's influence. Today is the day where you can walk in victory over your sin nature and, and learn to overcome and not be addicted by this beast within that we fight with. And we need the Holy Spirit to change our hearts, to change our orientation and to give us power to overcome so we don't get drawn into addictive patterns and, and self-centered and destructive, dysfunctional patterns uh, we need him today to help us. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. So when we talk about the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he is the Jesus who is alive today. And though we can't see him, is in heaven. He has sent the Holy Spirit to represent him. He's the same nature as Jesus. And we're better off not having Jesus physically with us because Jesus can be with us here today and he can be with every Christian family centre church that we've planted, every CRC church, every Pentecostal church, every church in the world at the same time. We're much better off not having Jesus physically with us. And you might say, oh, Pastor Bill, if Jesus walked in and I could see him and he said, son, move aside, I'm taking over. I'll rush out the front and touch the hem of his garment and be healed and be delivered and be set free. I could believe for anything if Jesus physically turned up and rocked up here. How many of you are that religious that that would be your feeling? You don't need Bill Vasilakis. You don't need another. You don't need Jonathan. You just need Jesus physically with us and I can believe for anything. Yeah? yeah. I'm trying to trick you. <laughs> I'm trying to trick you. So don't say yes or no. I'm playing a game with you. The truth is this. You should be rushing out the front now, touching the hem of my garment. Because I have Jesus in me. Or you should be rushing to touch the hem of Alan Steele's garment or touch the hem of, of uh, Mr. Cherkov's... What's your first name? Alex. Alex. <laughs> touch the hem of his garment. Why? Because Jesus is in him as well. And Jesus wants to minister through us as believers because we have him in us through the Holy Spirit. So let's do away with religious notions. Let's look at what the scripture really says. So, so healing is for today because Jesus never changes. Look at this, this verse here. I love this. It's one of my favorites. This is a summary statement that Peter, as he's proclaiming the gospel, the good news, Dr. Luke records it in the book of Acts, and it expresses Jesus' heart and his will. I love this. In Acts 10, 36, uh, Peter says to, the, to his hearers, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace. You want to put the next verse up, guys, Acts 10? Announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. Oh, who is Lord of all. Isn't that a wonderful statement? The good news of peace. We have great news. We have great news. Jesus came to introduce you to his Father. He came to remove the awful barrier of your sinfulness that you could do nothing about through his life and his death on a cross 
so that he could build a bridge. The cross is a bridge between heaven and earth that you can go through that and you can look in the Father's face and he says, you're forgiven. I quit you of all your sins. You're having a fresh start, a new start. I don't look at your past. I don't look at your sinfulness. I look at my son's sacrifice on your behalf. You are saved by grace, God's free unmerited favour, God's riches at Christ's expense. We look to him. And Peter says, look, it's good news. It's great news. We announce good news of peace. You can have peace with God the Father. And he brings peace into your own soul. He takes the sword of vengeance and anger and bitterness and rage and and lust and all those things that that would blind us and and divide us and hinder us from walking with him and walking in love and unity with our brothers and sisters and, and internal harmony with ourselves. He announces the good news of peace, peace with God, peace among people, peace within your own soul. Because you know what has happened. He's speaking to his readers. You know what happened. These people are alive at the time of Jesus when he walked. Throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, the northern parts, after the baptism that John preached, John the Baptist, you know, and, and how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good. I love that. God visits the planet, and you know what he wants to do? He just wants to do good to people. He wants to alleviate suffering. He wants to deal with sin, selfishness. He wants to to, to help people who are struggling with sickness and heal them. Um, People who who are troubled by evil spirits sitting on their shoulder and speaking evil into their minds and wrong thinking, wrong beliefs. He cast them away. He even controlled the elements. He even resuscitated people from the dead to demonstrate that his kingdom has come and this is God's will. This is God's heart. He hates sin. He hates sickness. He hates demonization. He hates suffering. He hates death. He hates the things that that, that cause people to do terrible things. That's why the picture in the book of Revelation of heaven is exactly like the Garden of Eden. It's beautiful. All those things are removed. And so Jesus came to earth to do good and to heal all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So sin, sickness, suffering, death is all the work of the devil. He's not saying that if a person is sick, that means that they are demonized. He's not saying if a person is sinful, does selfish things, that means they have a a, a demon possessing them. He is saying a, a, a clear theological statement from Genesis 1, 2 and 3 that the originator of all this suffering and pain was was people's choice to go the wrong way, empowered by a deceptive enemy, the devil. That's why he can't get saved, whereas we can get saved. Because we were deceived. We thought it was the right thing. We were responsible, we were deceived. He was never deceived. He was corrupt through and through. And so... Jesus came to heal all who were oppressed of the devil. So he says all these dark things are oppression of the the devil. And so one day all of it's going to be removed. When he returns and his literal presence, his physical literal presence and power will change everything, the devil's going to be destroyed, sin no more, death, no more pain, no more suffering, no more evil, no more tears. What Revelation, the final chapters of Revelation tell us. So it says how Jesus of Nazareth was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And folks, do you know what? That's what Jesus is still doing today. That's what he's still doing. And this is what he wants to do through you and through me. Yes, you as a believer. If you have Jesus in you, if the Holy Spirit is in you, He can use you to do his works and to undo the devil's works, to push back darkness and to see his kingdom advance as people come to faith and find healing and life and deliverance and freedom. Isn't that a great scripture? So healing is for today because Jesus never changes. Secondly, because Jesus' death provided salvation, healing and freedom for us all. And Matthew, in in his gospel, he reflects about Isaiah's great messianic passage because as he's watching Jesus doing stuff 
he's thinking, man, that's what Isaiah said, Isaiah 53. And so he, he, he puts something down in his gospel that has driven theologians crazy about, hey, healing in the atonement, deliverance in the atonement. I thought the atonement, the death of Jesus, just had to do with dealing with forgiveness, bringing forgiveness and, and, and a sense of salvation, spiritual salvation. That's not what, what, what Matthew says here. <laughs> he says, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him. So you can touch people that are sick. You don't even have to pray out loud. You can touch them. If Jesus is in you and in your heart, just say, Lord, right now, manifest a healing gift. Just say, be healed in Jesus' name. And they can be healed. We can't guarantee it. So oftentimes Jesus doesn't pray doesn't beg the Father for grace and mercy. He just expects that there are sick people and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to bring healing and, and restoration and health. And you can do the same if Jesus is in you. You're not Jesus. You have to represent him. And so he goes on. He goes, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. Now, that word demon-possessed is a terrible word. The, the, the translators are just wrong. They should have consulted me as a Greek man. <laughs> because the, the, the term, the English term, demon-possessed, means you are possessed by the devil. That means you've got no control, no freedom. That's ridiculous. Even Legion in Mark chapter 5, who says he, he, they called him Legion because he had a legion of evil spirits in him, and he did some crazy things, running around naked, cutting himself, screaming, yelling, they couldn't bind him. You know, wouldn't live at home with his wife and kids, living among the tombs. Uh, he was terribly bound by lots of evil spirits and Jesus delivered him. But if he was totally controlled, why didn't he go and just kill himself? The devil doesn't have that power. He cannot destroy your life. He cannot take life. And so Legion was free enough, cognitive enough, to be able to go to Jesus fall at Jesus' knees and give his life over to him because he knows that Jesus is the only one that can heal him. And he gets delivered and set free and becomes an evangelist for Jesus, a soul winner in his community. And so that just speaks to us that Legion was free enough to make choices. He could eat and drink. If the devil is so powerful, well, he could have, could have starved him to death and, you know, not drink and eat. And, no, no, it's not true. So don't, don't believe the mythology. The devil does not have absolute power. He is under the authority of, of God. Jesus has absolute authority and power. That's why we're not scared of him. So when it says many who were demon-possessed, it says those who were, it literally means, I call it demoned in the Greek. Demon is many. It means they were, came under the influence of demonic power. Okay? And all of us can come under the influence of demonic power. Peter! The great leader of the twelve. There was a time, there were several times, when there's a demon that comes and sits on his shoulder and starts whispering in his ears and he starts believing the nonsense because of his own dysfunction, empowering the negative in him. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You don't even know what you're saying. If you don't know what you're saying, your words, you're opposing God. Yet he loves Jesus, loves God, serves God, but there's a time when he was demonized. You understand? Came under the influence of the demon. Jesus had, to, had to, to rebuke him and say, get behind me, Satan. Because he could see the demon on his shoulder speaking that stuff. And he says, get away from here. You, Peter, I've prayed for you that the devil won't destroy you. All of us have a sinful nature. All of us have, as uh, Johnny Cash in his magnificent song, if you've ever seen it or listened to it, The Beast Within, it's a great song. Great song, I love it. He doesn't say the sinful nature within me, he goes, the beast within. And he talks about this beast, you know, and in country style. And it's just so classic sound theology of how you deal with the beast through Jesus Christ and faith and prayer. And, uh, and so the beast is within us. And uh, we, don't lo we no longer have to be under its control if we're yielded to Jesus. But I tell you what, if you don't stay yielded to Jesus and filled with the Spirit, enabled by the Spirit, that beast will rise up. And when it rises up and you start going into that dark area, lust, resentment, 
unforgiveness, bitterness, envy, jealousy, hatred, all the negative stuff. You start yielding to that, a handle will build up, and you will draw, if there's a, a, a work of darkness, an attitude of darkness, you will attract a passenger from hell. And they are attracted to darkness. So if you're walking with Jesus, they just bounce off you. They're scared of us, but if you indulge in darkness, you'll attract a passenger. And that anointing from hell will make that natural problem 10 times, 20 times worse. That's why people say, I don't know what happened. It started so small, but it became so big. You've got to recognize this is spiritual warfare. And when Jesus came, he said, I'm going to flick off these demons from people because they're, I can see them. They're evil. They're nasty. They're, they're, they're causing pain and suffering. So he came to release people from demonic power. And today, he wants to release you from demonic power. If you've been demoned, not demoted, and you're sensing, you know what? I think there's a passenger that's sitting on my shoulder. You've got to ask the question, why is he attracted to you? What do you have in common with him? Break the commonality. Let light replace darkness and you'll be able to fling him off in Jesus' name. So Jesus came and said, and it says, when evening came, many who were under the influence of demonic power were brought to him and he drove out the spirit with a word and healed all their sick. So he healed physical illness and he healed spiritual illness in the demonic area. And most importantly, he healed people's souls by restoring them back to the Father and pronouncing them forgiven and saved by his grace. And then Matthew goes, man, this is, now I see what Isaiah is saying. And this drives people crazy, this part. Because this was to fulfill what was spoken to the prophet Isaiah. Because everyone took Isaiah, everyone takes Isaiah as being spiritual healing. Matthew says, no, 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 physical healing, deliverance, also is part of the package as well as spiritual healing. And he said, he took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Let's read Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. So predominantly the work of the cross, Jesus' death on the cross, is to procure our salvation, our spiritual salvation, the assurance of forgiveness of sin, peace with God, the gift of eternal life, number one. But he also says, he, and by his wounds we're healed. So Isaiah sees him wounded, beaten, and he says, oh, yeah, 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 and, and physical healing comes. And then Peter, when he's referring to the Isaiah passage, he says this, 1 Peter 2.24, he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. So you can live above sin through the power of the Spirit. But he goes, then by his wounds you have been healed. So Matthew, so, so Isaiah looks and says, yeah, I see the suffering saviour, I see the Messiah. Yeah, I see that he's saving, he's actually saving and healing and delivering. And then Matthew goes, yeah, man, I see it. You know, Peter's mother-in-law and all these people bound by evil spirits and sickness. Yeah, I see that healing is in the atonement. It's spiritual healing and physical healing and emotional healing and relational healing. And then Peter goes, yeah, yeah. Because he looks back and says, yeah, through the cross we have provision. The basis for healing, the basis for answered prayer is not because of your worth and because of your good works. It has to do because of his worth and his good works on our behalf. So in the New Testament, people get healed, then they confess their sins. <laughs> in the James passage, he says, yeah, if you're sick, let's, let's believe for healing and you'll be healed. And by the way, your sins will be forgiven too. It's almost like, hey, the package is spiritual, physical, emotional, relational. God wants to bring relief and healing into our souls. I love that. And thirdly, the final thing I want to make is because Jesus' healing gifts are set or appointed in his church. They're set. He says, now you are the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed, and that word place should be set or appointed. It's a stronger word than placed. In the church, first of all, apostles, leaders. Secondly, prophets, teachers then miracles, then gifts of healing and helping, guidance. He's actually saying, 
as the Holy Spirit is absolutely central to the outworking of Jesus' mission through his church, these things are to operate as long as we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will be here until Jesus returns. So therefore, these things are to operate within the life of the church. And so the, the, the actual Greek word for set or appointed, and Paul uses the, the language of uh, the, the, the era that in every town, in every village, there were temples to the gods that were around, all the various gods, from Zeus to Aphrodite to Athena. Like you go to Athens, you go to the Parthenon. The Parthenon was built around the idol of Athena, who was the goddess of Athens. And so what they used to do was they would get the idol first and set the idol deep within the earth and then usually build the temple around it. So if you destroyed the temple, you just, if you destroyed the idol, you destroyed the temple. There's no reason for the temple if the idol's not there. So he's saying, hey, look, God has set these things in the church and, and, and it's, it's absolutely indispensable for the church, the nature of of the church and the ministry of the church is centered around our idol, I hate using that term, is Jesus. We idolize him and through the spirit and he has appointed these gifts. So the Holy Spirit has been given and he can't leave until Jesus returns and so gifts of healing, helping, guidance, miracles are part and parcel of the package and that's why Mark 16 we are now to appropriate Jesus' promises and power through the Holy Spirit, by faith. And so in Mark 16, it says, and these signs will accompany those who believe. How many of you are believers here today? Yeah? It doesn't say they will accompany those who are ordained pastors of the CRC who are in leadership at the Christian Family Centre. There is a place for leadership and ordination, and we have that as a denomination. But that doesn't make us the ones that are in control of all these ministries. Lord forbid. It says believers. You're a believer if you've placed your faith in Christ. And these signs will accompany those who believe or who trust in Jesus. In my name, they will drive out demons. Divine deliverance can occur through you. You can speak against the demons that are harassing your son, your daughter, your cousin, your friend. You haven't got authority over a person's will, but by golly, you have authority over the demons that will influence their thinking. And I would pray and fast and resist the devil from them and pray that God the Holy Spirit will move upon people's hearts. Salvation comes as people pray and believe. That's why we've had a day of prayer and fasting on Thursday. And we're doing another one next Thursday and the following Thursday. I was in Melbourne and I fasted for a couple of those meals. Not for the three. You can choose one or two and just put my times up. God, let there be healings that take place. May our services here, may there be healing power, salvation power. And so, in my name, not your name, not the name of the Christian Family Centre, not the name of the CRC, in my name, Jesus' name, you will drive out demons, divine deliverance. You will speak in new tongues, divine languages, baptism in the Holy Spirit. If you haven't received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, grab my booklet. It's at the back there where I do signings and stuff. Grab it, read it. If you haven't experienced this beautiful prayer language that brings intimacy with your relationship with the Father, then you need to receive the experience. There's another one on, on healing, God's answers for your healing by Bayless Conley that we've, we've actually typed up a message of his, a great message on, on healing. And then he says... They will speak in your tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. But don't go home and drink a gallon of petrol or cleaning fluid. Don't go looking for a brown snake. He's not saying that. He's actually saying there will be divine protection when accident, potential accidents. If you're doing the will of God, you can expect protection. Divine deliverance, divine languages, divine protection, and then finally divine healing. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Hallelujah. Believers, you can flick off demons in Jesus' name. You can speak in these new prayer languages. And if I was you, if you have the gift, I would use it every day. I'd spend five to ten minutes a day, whether you're in the car, in the shower, on your own, just, just talking to God in your prayer language, developing it. It forces intimacy on your own, on your knees, calling out to him. Man, I was calling out to him this morning. I'm saying, Lord, I'm really tired. I've been busy traveling. 
And physically I could feel, I said, God, I start to pray in the Spirit. I said, Lord, I expect your strength and your power to help me to be able to deliver the message that I feel you have for the people today. And I feel fantastic. I feel like I've slept for a week. I'll go home this afternoon and I'll be knocked out. Shoo. But the Holy Spirit helps us. He enables us. And so he will work through you. You're a believer. Jonathan Osmond, one of our pastors, he has set up a mission in uh, northern Uganda, a place called Aru. And, and, and Jono's going to go back in the next couple of weeks. He probably spends half the time there. And God has used him, literally, to see thousands of men and women and kids come to Christ over the 15 years that he's been ministering there. And he's been in some pretty hairy situations in South Sudan, the Congo, right nearby. And we keep saying to him, be careful, son, be careful. There you go, because he's a man of faith. But the number of healings and miracles that have taken place. Jono, you're, gonna, you're our preacher tonight. You're not our preacher this morning. You got it? Share a testimony or two of God's healing power. Let's welcome Jonathan. We'll cut you loose tonight. Okay, I'll give two testimonies. Uh, one from Australia, a local one, and uh, one from Africa. So the first one um, was in the Adelaide Hills. And uh, there was a lady in our church who had tore, torn the ligaments in her ankle. She was on crutches and she couldn't put any weight on, the, on her foot at all. So after church, um, she came forward for prayer. And when, when um, I was able to pray for her, um, I really felt like God was doing something. So I said, give, I said to her, give me your crutches. So she, she gave me her crutches. I said, just put some weight on your foot. Which I don't re recommend everyone to do that. But um, so she put weight on her foot, and then I said, "Walk." So she began walking around, and and then I said, "Jump up and down." She began jumping up and down, and then she began running around the church, around and around the church, and um, she was totally healed. And the church members, they saw what was happening, but they still couldn't uh, couldn't really believe it. It was really interesting seeing the reaction of the church members. And then about four weeks later, one of the church members said to me, okay, she's healed. <laughs> um, Very good. Uh, uh, the other testimony, this is not that long ago in, in West Nile of Uganda, which is, of course, hence the name West Nile, west of the Nile River, where we operate. Uh, we did a crusade, which is a large meeting outdoors where, where about 4,000 people came to hear the gospel. And um, we were able, with the team that was with us, just to pray for some of the really sick people just around the stage. And um, some deaf mutes came and lined up. And the first two of the, the deaf mutes who had never heard and never spoken before in their entire lives, of course, they come with their friend, their family member, to speak for them, because obviously you can't really communicate with them except sign language or whatever, which I'm not very good at. Um, <laughs> So I remember praying for the first and second one and both of them were, were healed and was able to hear for the first time in their life and to begin speaking. Normally when someone's never spoken before, it takes some time to learn to use their vocal cords properly. But yeah, began speaking and um, I just remember the joy on their faces whenever you see someone who has never experienced one of their five senses before. And they, they, most of the time, they're full of joy. And they, they smile and they're really excited. So it was just an amazing ex experience. And also, I mean, there were so many things God did in those few days. Um, there were also, oh gosh, um, three people who had had strokes and half of their body was paralysed. They were healed as well. Wow. Um, just all sorts Thank of miracles you. God was doing. And, yeah, God is amazing anywhere. He's the same. Yes, I'm not going to preach. That's all I have to say. Very good, very good. You preach it tonight, John. I'll be sitting in the front row. I want to receive benefit from your great preaching. Hey, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His death on the cross provided the basis by which we can pray, believing prayers, and to know that these things are his will. 
It's his will to lift the curse from people. It's his will to lift suffering. It's his will to forgive sin. It's his will to heal the sick. It's his will to deliver the bound. Uh, we can't guarantee that every single person will come through. We, we, we're not God. We, we don't know that. I had someone ask me the question at, uh, at the 830 service. I said about gifts of healing. Uh, if the person is the healer, then they, they will operate those gifts all the time. I said, no, not necessarily. I said, because if I have the gift of healing in myself or the ability to work miracles in myself, what am I doing here? I'll go to the Royal Adelaide Hospital and clean out the hospital. If I could do that at will, I can't. The gifts of healing are in the Holy Spirit. Jesus does the healing through us. And so therefore, there has to be an atmosphere of faith and believing and obedience by those who are going to step out and pray for the sick and needy and we leave the results back to God. And we can't guarantee it. Like you heard Kathy's testimony of the busted shoulder that required massive surgery. She was instantly healed. There are other people in this church that have had the same thing. They've been prayed for, but they weren't healed physically. They were healed by the gift of medical science. I don't understand that. I just say God be praised if they're healed, if they're restored. Um, and so, you know, the, medic, the gift of medical science is a manifestation of God's will and heart to alleviate suffering. And so it's not a matter of pray or go to the doctor. I pray. I often say, prayer and pills go together beautifully. I go to Dr. Jesus and I go to Dr. Kish, my doctor. I go to both. People say, oh, you know, but they, they want to get super spiritual. You know, well, well, I think it's God's will that I be sick, that I stay in my suffering. And that, uh, you know, because maybe they prayed and they weren't healed, then they come to a false conclusion, then maybe it's God's will that I be sick. Well, that's illogical. Because then they'll go to the doctor, to a specialist, and take pills to get out of the will of God. Hey? Eh? If you believe it's the will of God that you be sick, don't go to a doctor, don't take medicine. Because you're getting out of God's will. Obviously, he has provided the healing disciplines because God loves people and he wants to alleviate as much suffering and pain until Jesus returns and wraps everything up. That's why we have psychologists and psychiatrists to heal minds and hearts. Why we have wonderful counsellors. You know, I look at someone like a Jill Steele, who's sort of retired counselling pastor, but she still does a little bit of caring and support. But the hundreds of people that she has helped... And the healing power of Jesus to, to, to restore and break the, the brokenness of people. She's brilliant at that. And we've got other counsellors and carers in, in the church that do that. Because the Lord provides means by which to alleviate pain and suffering. And medical science. And so I love doctors. I, I work with them. So I, I think they're really important. And so I just, they're just not God. Jesus is God. And he has the final answer. And, uh, and so, therefore, um, healing is the will of God. Salvation is the will of God. Deliverance is the will of God. And so we pray and believe, because, and we have an assurance that God is good, that God is great, that God answers prayer. And even if the answer doesn't occur how I want it, I give thanks to him because he knows best anyway. I trust him. Now have a look at James 5, and then I want to have time of prayer with you. Is anyone among you in trouble? Don't lift your hand up. <laughs> I'm in trouble every week with my wife. <laughs> what do I do? Pray. <laughs> Jesus, change your heart. Help her. <laughs> Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. So I have songs of praise in my car. I have wonderful secular songs, the great Elvis Presley, Aretha Franklin, you know, beautiful songs. And sometimes they sing gospel songs. Are they great? And I have Christian songs. I went, just praise him. You need, sing. Have great songs that you can sing. Put them on at home. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call for, and this is really the leaders, the authority in the church, those who are in governance, those who are in ministry leadership. doesn't mean that they should do, they're the only ones, they're believers too. In other words, call the leaders of the church and uh, to pray over them. So today, we're going to pray over you and anoint you with oil. Hey, this is practical. This is 
How do you appropriate Jesus' promises and powers? You've got to do something practical. You've got to step out in faith. So oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And for those of you that have been prayed for many times by me, you'll notice I put a sign of the cross on, on your forehead and on your hand. Not too much oil, so it doesn't spoil your clothes. Go to Africa and see how much oil they pour on you. <laughs> Ruins your clothes, man. Why? Because it was because of the cross of Jesus, his death, that the legal basis by which we can approach God to receive the benefits occurred and only when he rose again and went to heaven that he sent the Holy Spirit to be the one by which the power comes and flows. And so anointing you with oil, when we anoint you with oil today, you just, just, just release your face. Say, Lord, I know it's the Holy Spirit that does the healing. When hands are laid upon you, visualize the hand of Jesus that is physically here with you, that it's his hand that's coming upon you. And it says... Pray over them, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord, not not our name. And the prayer offered in faith, in other words, you trust him. You move by what you believe and not by what you see. We walk by faith and not by sight. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. Notice that? doesn't say when, it just says the Lord will raise them up. And just by the way, if you sinned this week and you've been naughty, you'll be forgiven. Hey! Some people say, oh, I can't come out the front for prayer. I can't take communion because I've sinned. Hey, give me a break. This is a hospital for sinners. Come, confess your sin. Take the communion, apologize to Jesus. Go back and tell your wife you've been a heel and apologize to her and go to that person. I mean, that's, you've got to live in forgiveness. And, and we need self-centeredness challenged all the time. So he says, hey, in the midst of this wonderful ministry time, if you've sinned, you'll be forgiven. Just talk to him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these powerful scriptures. Thank you for Jonathan's testimony of healings. Thank you for what you're doing among us. What you're going to do in the healing clinic today. Lord, we pray for people that are incurably ill or terminally sick. We pray for those that are in desperate condition that you would stretch out your hand and bring healing and life and deliverance to them. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, do that. And today in this service is now we conclude by taking your supper, Jesus, the Lord's Supper. As we take the emblems, as we get anointed with oil, as we have hands laid upon us, as we pray prayers of faith, we know that you do the healing and the saving and the restoring and the delivering. Oh, let the enemy be king hit out of this place today from people's lives. Let sick bodies be made whole. Let pain dissipate. Let those that have got chronic illnesses receive the gift of healing that they need. And for those that need forgiveness, may they find a saviour that wants to grab them and hug them and love them through, to, to, to give them a sense of belonging. And as they believe, they will find release from their sins and their guilt and their shame and their fear that there is forgiveness through the cross of Jesus as they believe. Lord, let it be in Jesus' name.